podcast, the only podcast that focuses on watching soccer on TV, online, and apps. In episode 105, we discuss how NBC Sports Gold is hurting the Premier League's growth. Uh, winners and losers of uh, Christian Pulisic uh, moving to Chelsea. Plus, we have uh, a ton of letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined by, today by my co-host, Kartik Krishnaya. Kartik, Happy New Year to you and to all of our listeners. Um, how's uh, 2019 treating you so far? So far, so good. I, I have a cold. Uh, I suppose I'm not, I'm not feeling that great, but... Uh... I uh, can't complain about anything else. All right, Kartik. So uh, it's the busy time of the festive season in England and, and also uh, in Scotland. Well, actually, Scot- Scotland's taking a break now, too. We have some games from Italy, too. But uh, from this past week, uh, lots lots to choose from. But what stood out for you as your match of the week? Okay, my two, the two best matches of the week for me were the Napoli-Bologna match. Uh, which was on uh, Saturday, last uh, round of fixtures in Serie A before the, uh, uh, before the winter break, and then uh, the Forest Leeds match, which was just phenomenal uh, on, uh, on January 1st, uh, which was a, a back-and-forth match where Leeds scored two goals uh, with Ted Mann, uh, then Forest came back and won the match. Uh, so those were, those were my two real standout matches of the week. Yeah, and later today, uh, by the time uh, everyone listens to this podcast on Thursday, we're recording it in the morning uh, before the Man City-Liverpool game. But, um, Kartik, you've written an article about uh, the championship and how it's really turned into one of the most exciting and entertaining leagues um, in, in, in the business, really. What, for you, about the championship makes it so appealing? Well, I think, first off, there's something on the line in every match, it, it, teams are either chasing promotion or they're trying to stay in that division. It's it, it, there's no. It's been and this has been the case for a number of years, Chris. It's so competitive the league that if you're mid-table, you have a shot to make the playoffs, and you have a shot with a bad run, uh, particularly during the festive period, of being sucked into the drop zone. The Premier League and most European leagues aren't quite like that. There is a a clear group of mid-table teams in the top divisions throughout Europe uh, of teams that, okay, we, we might start talking about it for a week or two. Oh, well, they are the bad run. They might get sucked into the relegation fight. Or, hey, maybe they can push in, push up and, and make it to Europe. But generally, there, there is a, a solid mid-table. The second thing is, I think because the prize of making the Premier League is so, uh, so lucrative, and I, I talked about this in the article on worldsoccertalk.com, because of that, teams are playing much more open, attractive football than uh, teams do in the Premier League, where they're trying to stay in the division and they don't want to lose those riches. So you're seeing more open attacking play. You're seeing more exciting matches. And because the the league is far more competitive, you don't have um, Liverpool, Spurs, Man City, whoever else, dominating and teams uh, that are trying to stay in the league sitting with eight or nine men behind the ball for the entire match and trying to hit uh, the, the superior team on the counter. Uh, you just have much more competitive and compelling football where you have to watch these matches. You can't uh, turn a match on and say, okay, I'm just going to kind of do other things during the match, and eventually there'll be a goal. Um, These matches tend to be uh, open and and, and entertaining. Now, obviously, there are exceptions, and there are exceptions to every all of these generalizations we make about leagues, but the uh, championship, to me, has become has eclipsed the Premier League in excitement level. I'm not alone. I've talked to a number of people who say the same thing. And I have to say, Chris, and this is, the I think, the takeaway for the listeners from our podcast, for our podcast, the uh, $5 price tag or $4.99 a month price tag for ESPN Plus has made the league remarkably accessible Mm -hmm. when compared to other leagues out there. And that even includes, to a certain extent, the Premier League because of NBC Sports Gold. Yeah, for me, the championship right now is what I remember the great things about the Premier League, say, a decade ago, or even two decades ago, which was, I mean, fantastic atmospheres, great crowds, I mean, lots of singing, um, but really entertaining football where you you didn't know what was going to happen. It was going to be frenetic, uh, end-to-end action, goals here, goals there, brilliant goals, great comebacks. And the, the Premier League, while I still love it, um, don't get me wrong, it's, it has bec- become very predictable in terms of the, the top six clubs are in total domination. Uh, kind of the bottom four are basically kind of really just really, really dire. 
and the middle is really kind of middle of nothing. It, it's very, it's very blah. In the championship, it is one of those things, Kartik. You're right. As far as I mean, game by game, you, you have no idea who's going, who's going to win that game. And it is lots of goals, lots of action, end to end action. And Leeds United, I think Kartik is is one of the um, one of the trailblazers, one of the reasons that has made the championship uh, uh, so entertaining this season, uh, um, um, among others too. This, this is not just Leeds United. But this Nottingham Forest Leeds United game, it was it was incredible to watch because it was at the same time as Arsenal against Fulham, and I started watching Arsenal and Fulham, um, and the crowd at, crowd atmosphere at the Emirates was really really just flat, and the game was flat too, just very slow paced, uh, kind of um, passing the ball around. Fulham's obviously probably has no chance of winning this game. I'm thinking. And I'm starting to watch it. I'm going, okay, you, you, I, I know that Arsenal's going to win this match. It, it's, it's pretty much uh, done before the game's even started. And I, so, so I flipped over to the Nottingham Forest and Leeds. And it was um, at, the, at that point in the game, I think it was, um, I think Forest was winning 1 0. Uh, then, then Leeds came back to 1 1. And then Leeds went ahead to make it 2 1. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, here we go. Leeds United again. Uh, great comeback. And then all of a sudden, it was 2 2. And then it was 3-2 to, to Nottingham Forest. And then it was 4-2 to Nottingham Forest. Just a really, really good game. And, and again, too, I mentioned this in last week's podcast, too, uh, Kartik, but Leeds United, their youth, uh, and just some of these younger players, some, some great players, which, which in some ways, they don't have the experience, but they do have the energy. Uh, and it, it's just a great team to watch. And, and Nottingham Forest, fair play to them, put on a great performance. And uh, I think, I think the, the, the winner in all of this was, was the viewer. It was just a great game. One of many I've seen um, this season in the championship. And based on maybe like the last, probably last four to five weeks, to me, I, I'm probably going to start watching more of the championship than the Premier League, at least, at least as my beginning destination. When I'm looking at games to choose from, I might start off watching the championship games. And then maybe going back to the Premier League game at the same time, if if the Championship uh, game uh, doesn't uh, doesn't live up to its billing, which which for me it's always kind of you mean when I'm trying to figure out what to watch, it's almost always the Premier League first, and then I might flip the channel and go someplace else if the match bores me. Yeah, I, I'm in that same boat, Chris. I've I've actually made the transition, as our listeners probably realized, the the last few weeks uh, to the Championship. I, I think. Back to Boxing Day, that atmosphere, we were talk, talking about uh, Forest, that atmosphere at Carroll Road, which, of course, has been a Premier League ground recently uh, it, for many years. With, with Norwich has uh, been kind of a yo-yo club in recent years and, and might, in fact, be back up this season. That atmosphere when Norwich, when the Canaries were trying to chase down Forest, uh, they, they were down 3-0 at one point. I, ha- I haven't felt an atmosphere, at least through my television or through my, uh, my, my device, all season uh, in the Premier League. It, w- it was just amazing. And, I th- and that was just one example of the atmospheres, I think, being better in the, in the championship than in the Premier League. The size of grounds is one of the factors. I think ticket prices is another, Chris. And that's something yeah. we don't necessarily get into a lot on this show. But uh, there are... Uh, countless examples in recent years of, of teams uh, being promoted uh, to the Premier League and their ticket prices being uh, th- them essentially pricing some of their um, supporters out, particularly for like for season cards. Maybe those supporters will come to some matches still in the Premier League, uh, but they tend to not come to midweek matches and they tend uh, maybe not to buy season cards anymore. Uh, that, that's, a, that's another factor. But the atmospheres, this is another thing for the listeners out there, the atmospheres at championship grounds, phenomenal. And the production that the EFL does for the matches, which is the, um, uh, which is the feed that is picked up by ESPN+, Plus, uh, really captures that. They do, they've learned a lot from the Premier League in terms of television production. Obviously, some of the commentators are the same. You'll hear, hear John Champion's voice at least for another month on, uh, on both uh, the championship and the Premier League. A lot of the commentators are the same, but I, I think the, 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 the grounds now, um, you're capturing the, the, the energy and excitement from those championship grounds because of the way they're producing the matches for television. Yeah, and the stigma that goes with... Oh, actually, this is something that came up on, on Twitter, I think, Kartik, I think you saw it too, but a comment from one of the um, one of our listeners said, uh, when I mentioned, I think, the, the Forest Leeds game, like where to watch it, uh, they said, uh, you mean Division Two, like yawn, like boring, and and there's a stigma that goes with a Division Two football. You mean, no, and this is probably more of an American thing, really, Kartik. You mean D- 
Division Two in America, as far as soccer goes, you mean whether you go USL, whether you go NASL, or you mean or others or, or split, it, there's a stigma in that, that, that there's a huge drop off in the quality of football. And with the championship, the the drop off is isn't that great. If, if anything, a lot of these teams playing in the championship, kind of especially the, the upper half of the table. I think could do very well against some of the the teams in the in the bottom half of the Premier League. It's just a different it is a different style of league though, Kartik, because it is more open ended in the Championship. It's more interesting and more entertaining to watch. Uh, the Premier League, to me, having gone through this with Swansea City for seven years, is very much um, very pragmatic. Very okay. You can make one mistake in a game and that's it. It's over and you're done. You've lost and then you've lost the three points. Uh, in the championship, uh, in some ways there are more mistakes, but uh, you mean it's back and forth, and it, and it is more entertaining. Um, but 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 there's that stigma with Division Two, and to me, I mean, I have no stigma over it. I mean, to me, it's entertaining, and to me, it's more enjoyable. And and, and like you said, to Kartik, it, it it is in many ways um, very accessible. I mean, it's for five bucks a month, you can watch what three or three to four championship uh, games uh, every weekend. And the quality level is great. The production level is good, and the football is good. It's entertaining football, good quality football, and um, with clubs going at it, just trying. I mean, you've got probably six to eight clubs with with a great a great chance of, of uh, if not winning the league, going into well, probably more than that, getting into the playoffs. I'd argue as there's been separation between the top six in the Premier League and the rest of the league. And I know people keep throwing at me the Leicester City example. That was a one-off. Uh, that was a uh, outlier, uh, an out, a complete outlier, right? And same thing with uh, even Southampton's ability to finish in the top six or seven for a number of years. What's happened is that since Leicester City won the title and Southampton had that run of three or four years where they were in the top half, we have had, or in the top eight, we've had uh, a new television deal. And the new television deal has made ha, has done uh, a few things. One, it's made the rich clubs even richer, the top six. And it's done two, uh, the teams that are mid-table do not, their chairman, their boards, do not want to drop out of the Premier League. So instead of playing in an open, entertaining way, and I would, uh, I would right off the bat say West Ham is an exception to this because they have the Olympic Stadium now, uh, which they were – basically gifted uh the taxpayers spent money on it and they have a history of wanting to their their supporters being more concerned about style of play than results mm -hmm. uh so take west ham out of the equation let's look at the rest of the premier league you have a number of clubs with chairmen who do not want to risk losing that uh that television money that premier those premier league riches so they cycle through managers quickly and when, while they're cycling through managers, those managers are instructed to get results at any cost, which generally means playing seven or eight or nine behind the ball, being very cautious, limiting those mistakes, Chris, as you say. One mistake can kill you in the Premier League. Uh, we see that repeatedly every week. So while you could argue the quality of footballer and the quality of football is better, um, the entertainment level isn't better. And I would also point out, I think, the, the bottom of the league, uh, the last – two or three seasons has been really weak uh, mm -hmm. in terms of teams that normally in, under, in normal circumstances in typical Premier League seasons prior to the last few seasons would have gotten relegated have stayed in the league. And because of that, I think the top teams in the championship are probably as good as those uh, as 13, 14, 15 in any given year in the Premier League now in, in the last few years. In the cycle of this television contract, this is year three of this television contract, uh, the new contract I think will continue the same cycle. Yeah, and from this past week in uh, watching the Premier League, there were some a lot of forgettable games. I mean, the the Chelsea Southampton game on Wednesday, a nil nil draw. Um, to me, NBC picked the wrong game here, Kartik. Uh, of all the games to show, and there were plenty of goal goals in some of the other games with like Bournemouth and West Ham and and other games. Uh, they ended up selecting the wrong one, which was the the nil nil between Chelsea and Southampton. Um, other games, I mean, the Liverpool-Arsenal game from the, the weekend, um, brilliant performance by Liverpool, but a very, very extremely one-sided uh, match this was. And uh, great performance by Liverpool. I mean, they're doing great at the top of the table, but uh, disappointing from Arsenal. And, and it, for, for the neutral, it wasn't the most entertaining match to watch by, by any means. Uh, Spurs against Wolves. This one was better, Kartik. Um, I listened to this one, actually, on the, on the BBC World Service commentary. Uh, with my headphones on, 
and uh, listening to the BBC World Service. And this one to me, um, with Matthew Upson co-commentating, and I think uh, Ian Dennis on, on the, the radio commentary, uh, what started off looking like it was going to be a very predictable kind of 1-0 uh, victory for, for Spurs actually did turn around and, and did become a, a more of an open-ended kind of um, uh, a two-sided affair and uh, with Wolves grabbing the, the, the surprise victory in this one. And uh, one other match I do want to mention that I did watch uh, was the Old Firm Derby uh, on, uh, I think it was like Saturday morning, I think it was uh, Rangers against Celtic, and this one on BR Live, and um, a good game. I mean, Rangers look good. I couldn't believe how good they looked. I was like surprised by this one because, I mean, it's always been that Celtic has, has dominated these matches. Uh, Celtic still in the Europa League, Rangers got knocked out, but uh, really impressive performance by Rangers winning this one 1-0, and of course, uh, another great atmosphere for a great uh, all firm derby. Kartik, how about you? And anything else uh, worth mentioning from uh, this past week? Yeah, I've got uh, these, uh, some of these NBC programs, the one that they debuted on New Year's Day uh, with, uh, I know there was a, a sh one with Paul Scholes, I think one with the Carragher. I've got those DVRs. So I'm looking forward to watching those. I haven't gotten a chance to watch those yet. Uh, the off script with... Uh, with Graham Lasso, was that uh, last week or this week? That was last very week. good. Yeah, last week. Okay, so uh, I guess we discussed that last week, uh, but that was very, very good. Uh, and then just in general, um, been watching a, a lot of the championship. I, I thought uh, the Borough Derby match was also a very good match from New Year's Day. Uh, that got kind of lost in the shuffle because of the Leeds Force match, but uh, that was an outstanding match, uh, which it, which ended one one and uh, actually benefited Leeds. They stayed top the table even though. Uh, uh, they've lost two on the bounce. Uh, everybody below them is dropping points. And, and uh, also watched uh, the, uh, a lot of Serie A, the last match day before the winter break, and there were some good matches there. That again on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, Chris, this is a whole theme now. I'm watching more Serie A than I have in years, and I'm watching more championship than I have in years. And the reason for that, even though I would always, I would always watch a little of the championship, there's no mm -hmm. doubt about that, but Serie A had kind of fallen off my radar for a number of years. Uh, these two properties shifting from BN, we love BN, but let's be honest about accessibility. Shifting from BN to ESPN Plus and also being available on demand has uh, allowed me uh, as a fan to catch up and watch far more Premier League and, far, uh, excuse me, far more championship and far more Serie A than I was two years, two seasons ago. Uh, this is perhaps uh, a good sign that even though there are a ton of leagues and a ton of, ton of properties being collected by ESPN for, for placement on ESPN Plus, that um, it is still good for the fans because yep. it is robust kind of dynamic um, streaming service that uh, allows you, that has incredible bandwidth. It's not like a linear television channel. So uh, watch this space. I, I, I think we're going to be talking more and more about this in the next few years. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more, Kartik, because um, with NBC Sports Gold, and, and that's probably the, the, the best uh, comparison, with NBC Sports Gold, um, to me, it, it really is kind of uh, really hurting the growth of the Premier League in, in the United States. And partly because, I mean, what we were used to, which was NBC Sports Live Extra, where we had access, if you, as long as you had a cable subscription or satellite subscription to NBCSN, you would get access to all of the other Premier League matches. And that would really, I think, was um, one of their keys, not, not the only key, but one of their keys to, to the success of NBC broadcasting in Premier League is make, making every single Premier League match as accessible as possible. And it's a great thing to talk to, like even whether it was people from overseas or uh, people new to the game, and you could say to them, like, well, actually, as long as you have NBCSN and I mean, NBC Sports Live Extra, you can pick any ch game. You can watch any game live from the Premier League. And at the time that the NBC Sports Gold was announced, um, what now, a couple of years ago and, and uh, launched, I came out really hard against it and said, this is ridiculous. This is, um, my issue wasn't the price. My issue was in terms of the accessibility. This, is, that, that this would actually hurt the Premier League um, where you can only, you mean, you can only see select games on television. This, this changes everything. And that's the difference to me is that with ESPN Plus, um, it's, in many ways, I mean, five bucks a month doesn't sound that much. I mean, it's you know, a, a cup of coffee or whatever it, it may be. Um, but the funny thing is with this Kartik is that actually it ends up being that NBC Sports Gold is actually cheaper than uh, ESPN+. Plus. doesn't feel that way, 
But with NBC Sports Gold, it's well, fifty dollars a season if you if you sign up at in, in August. Uh, ESPN Plus is five dollars a month, so it's actually uh, sixty dollars a year. It's ten dollars more. But in terms of the way it's structured, you mean five bucks a month? You mean I, I can keep on paying that on just a, a monthly loop? Um, yeah. Fifty bucks a month is is a lot more. But yeah, to, you have to pay it. You have to pay it in one fell swoop. Right? Yeah, and, and it feels it feels more. It feels like it hurts your pocket more, uh, even though it doesn't over the course of a year. But 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 to me, I mean, I mean, I think I've probably. I mean, this this yeah, Wednesday was a good, great example. Chelsea against Southampton. A really dull, boring, nil-nil game, and I was like, okay, I, I don't have NBC Sports Gold. Once Swansea went down, I was like, okay, that's it, I'm, I'm done with that. But to me, like, I was my 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 finger was itching, my trigger finger was itching to switch it over to watch Bournemouth or or West Ham or one of these other games with lots of goals happening, and I didn't have it. I was like, in some ways, I was like, and I, I, actually, even Man United, Newcastle against Man United. The last two Man United games have not been on television. They've been on NBC Sports Gold. And that, this is being done on purpose to try to get people to sign up for it. But uh, I don't know. What do you think, Kartik? Do you think it's, it's hurting the Premier League at all? Well, I think it certainly is. And, and uh, let me just mention, I, uh, I, I watched that match on NBC Sports Gold, the United, uh, well, Manchester United, Newcastle United match, Newcastle United hosting that match at St. James Park. And I had a couple of uh, technical glitches in the early stages of the match uh, when um, uh, my, my audio feed went out at one point and at one point the video went out and the audio feed was still running. So uh, these are the sorts of problems with the BAM Tech, uh, 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 the BAM Tech, uh, uh, driven ESPN Plus, I haven't had watching countless events on there. I've watched a handful of uh, things on NBC Sports Gold. Uh, you know, maybe 10% of what I've watched on e e ESPN Plus, if even that, and uh, have had more technical glitches on NBC Sports Gold. But yeah, uh, I, I think people have trigger fingers, particularly with a lot of these nil-nil draws. There are so many dour matches in the Premier League. They're either nil-nil draws, Chris, or they're matches where. That Arsenal-Liverpool match felt like a match between a top side and uh, a, a mid-table to, to uh, relegation fighting side. Yeah. Once Liverpool got the first goal off the error, you knew what was going to happen. I, and um, I was watching the, the match with a few friends who were Arsenal fans saying it was going to be 4-5-1. or five, one. Uh, And it ended up being that. I mean, it could have been worse. Uh, that's, that's what's happened to this league. So that's not NBC's fault, right? That That's just what's happening in the league. But NBC at the point where it got less competitive, the league, and this is, again, not their fault, but they just their, their timing was bad. At the time when the league got less competitive, they then threw a bunch of matches that they used to give us uh, for free or essentially for free if you had the cable subscription, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, behind the paywall. So, yeah, I think it has hurt the growth of the Premier League. I think it's hurt the interest in the Premier League. The ratings are still good, but they're stagnant. And uh, we'll get into that a, a little later. I, I do think there's a direct correlation, unfortunately. And I was one of those people who, when you were um, a, a very critical of them launching this product, defended them, bought the product. And in fact, I mean, I, I'm a little embarrassed now. You can go back and look at my tweets from 18 months ago with promoting the product, saying, hey, this is a great bargain. You can get every Premier League match. You get all these uh, bumper programs and ancil uh, ancillary programs. It, it hasn't worked out that way for me as someone who's bought it. So uh, I think you were right. 18 months later, I'm, I'm conceding that. Yeah, in a way, actually, it probably drives more people to ESPN Plus in, in, because it's one of those things where, you I mean, if one match is boring and they're thinking, OK, what do I watch now? Do I do I sign up for NBC Sports Gold, which at this point in the season, I think they're offering it for like $30, I think it is. But do I sign up for $30 or do I pay five bucks and watch the championship? And, and it's I mean, in, in some ways, NBC Sports Gold is actually helping ESPN Plus in terms of uh, driving up their subscriptions because the price, price point is so appealing. Now, if NBC Sports Gold said, okay, you know what, we're going to change our pricing for next season and we'll make it five bucks a month, then, then I think it, it, it is strange, but it becomes more, um, it becomes a better option. It becomes, uh, you mean, uh, it's something that, that I might sign up for. But, but maybe, maybe that's something for NBC Sports Gold for next season for uh, kind of the, the price point and, ha and how that changes the thought process. But, uh, yeah, I think it has held back the Premier League in the, in the U.S., the growth. Um, and, again, NBC Sports, by doing this, is looking for ways to generate more revenue, and they see this as the future. Um, and it's not a cord-cutting solution. So if you're a cord-cutter and you want to watch uh, the Premier League, 
it's you have to buy NBC Sports Gold plus either Fubo or Sling TV or PlayStation View or YouTube TV, etc. It's not kind of a cord cutting solution. Like with the championship with the ESPN Plus, you can say, okay, if I have ESPN Plus, I can have all access to every single championship game that's available. Uh, not every single game that is, is available, but there you go, Kartik. All right, so let's move on to TV streaming news. Not a lot of news this week in terms of the industry, but we did have a big story this week, Kartik, uh, on Tuesday. And that was um, Christian uh, Pulisic moving from Borussia Dortmund to Chelsea uh, for a fee of £55 million, pounds, about uh, $73 million, and uh, to Chelsea and then immediately loaned back to Dortmund uh, for the rest of the season and uh, will then move to Chelsea in the summertime. This is a big story, Kartik, uh, especially in the United States, especially for a player who's just 20 years old, uh, a record signing for an American uh, first of all, what's your take on it? And then second of all, who do you think are, are the winners and losers from this? Well, obviously Dortmund has made a lot of money off of this. And because the U.S. doesn't abide by the solidarity payment regime that FIFA mandates, uh, that's in FIFA statutes, uh, his uh, youth club in Hershey, Pennsylvania, PA Classics, will not get uh, what they would be entitled to normally from this transfer, which would be about 750000 which could sustain the club for years and years and years. But uh, that, that aside... Dortmund is a big winner. Uh, Dortmund uh, is not losing a critical first-team player also for this fee. I mean, he's a guy that under Thomas Tuchel was a top uh, player, was one of their their, their, their leading options. As uh, uh, the years have gone on, uh, particularly under Petr Stoger and now uh, Lucien Favre, uh, you've seen them turn the page towards uh, Guerrero on the left and uh, Jaden Sancho, the, the young English player for, formerly of Manchester City, on the right, uh, or Manchester City's academy, right, was never a first-team player for Manchester City, uh, went to Dortmund at 18, and uh, and pushed Marco Royce into a, a striker position, and Pulisic has been uh, caught in a numbers crunch there. I don't think he's necessarily regressed as a player. I do think he stagnated as a player, and the opportunity – he's gotten this season at Dortmund uh, he hasn't been great he hasn't been as good as he was in the past and I would point out their two biggest matches of the year the uh, match against Mucin Gladbach that we talked about on last week's pod podcast the match against Bayern earlier in the season he was left on the bench he was an unused sub um, Chelsea has a marketing machine now in the United States right mm -hmm. I think that has a lot to do with this this decision to buy uh, what is acknowledged as uh, the best American player of a generation, but potentially the best American field player of all time, if he continues on uh, the trajectory he was on about a year ago. Uh, also, uh, he fits Sarri's system really well. I can see where he slots in. Uh, if Eden Hazard goes in the summer, uh, he slots in maybe in the Hazard role, as it is now both Villian and Pedro, two very accomplished players. Pedro has won everything there is to win in this in this sport, right? World Cups, Euros, uh, Premier Leagues, La Ligas, Champions Leagues. Uh, Pedro uh, is 31, right? He's on his way down. Uh, you, you have to start managing these guys' uh, uh, games. Although, quite frankly, both Villian and Pedro at times this season have looked like younger players in sorry system. They look very rejuvenated versus where they were under Conte. But I think Pulisic is a bet for the future uh, for Chelsea, and he will work out if, this is the big if, Chris, if Sarri remains the manager. Now, if Sarri gets sacked, the way we see Chelsea go through managers every two or three seasons, uh, or even in less time, and he is replaced by an Antonio Conte or Jose Mourinho-type tactical manager, Pulisic will uh, be will, will probably not uh, end up having to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a this is, seems to be a very manager-driven move. I don't know that Sarri specifically requested Pulisic. As I said, I think Pulisic a lot of it has to do with the marketing potential for Chelsea in the United States. But in terms of the player's quality and the player's skill set, uh, he's a very good dribbler. He's very good in open spaces. Uh, he is a fairly good passer. He's a lethal finisher when in front of goal. Uh, but he is not a great defender. He is not a great one-touch passing player. Um, and he's not great positionally, uh, particularly when he plays in the middle of the, of the pitch. He, he has to almost play wide to be... Uh, more effective those skills the, the skill set the positive skill set fits sorry's uh tactics the negative skill set won't bother sorry as much as it would a conte 
or a Mourinho. Just to use those two examples because those are two Louis and Chelsea managers. So there is some risk in this for Christian Pulisic. If Sarri is given a longer leash than Robin Abramovich gives managers, uh, and he's there for three, four, five seasons, I think Pulisic is going to thrive. If he is sacked after next season, Pulisic might be loaned out the following year and looking for a new club the year after that. So uh, there is some risk in this, and I think it's all contingent on Sarri, uh, who we have to remember is about 60 years old, being the Chelsea manager for a long period of time. It's uh, it's a positive risk, though, I think, Karthik, because there's a lot of people on Twitter that are complaining already, just I mean, within, within hours of, of this deal being signed, uh, complaining that uh, this is a bad move for Pulisic. Pulisic, it's a bad move for him because uh, he's not going to get much playing time. He's going to be you mean, on the bench or he's going to be loaned out to a club in, in uh, Holland or someplace. Um, we don't know yet. I mean, w- there's a lot of unknowns with this that in terms of, you mean, as long as Sarri stays there. Uh, it's up to Pulisic, Pulisic in terms of his playing level and uh, how much he's willing to kind of learn and work hard and try to break into this team. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens, and hopefully he'll stay at Stamford Bridge and won't be loaned out and will become a, a prominent player either off the bench, I mean, he has to pr- prove himself, uh, or, or on, on the pitch. But to me, the biggest winners and losers in this, Kartik, um, the biggest loser is the Bundesliga. Now, the Bundesliga, yes, they have uh, Pulisic until between now and, and the summer, uh, but he's not getting much playing time at Dortmund. Um, but there'll be an increased awareness, perhaps, over the next few months to try to see if, if he's going to get back on, on, the, on the pitch a little bit more. Um, but whatever happens, the Bundesliga is going to miss this one big time because uh, even though he hasn't had a massive impact on the TV ratings, um, there's definitely been a, an increased interest in the Bundesliga because of Pulisic. And also, I mean, Borussia Dortmund, too. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of Borussia Dortmund fans uh, in the United States that became fans because of Pulisic. The other loser in this one is, is Fox. Uh, again, the TV ratings aren't that big on uh, uh, on Fox for the Bundesliga, but it's it's one less American in the in the German pack there. You've got you know, Weston McKinney and uh, Josh Sar- Sargent and others that could rise to a Pulisic level in the future, but they're not there yet. Uh, the biggest winners potentially are going to be NBC Sports um, and, and, and really Chelsea Football Club in the United States. Imagine if Pulisic does get playing time and starts off the season for the 2019-2020 season, uh, either on the bench or, or starting for, for Chelsea. And you can imagine how many people are going to be tuning in to watch this. This takes him to an, a new level. Uh, in the United States, and it also takes NBC Sports uh, to a new level. If you have an American, a talented American, if he's going to be playing week in, week out, or, or at least in contention uh, for places in one of, the, you know, one of the top teams in England. So lots of winners, lots of losers in this. Uh, at the end of the day, the biggest winner in this one is, is Christian Pulisic. I mean, he's, he's proven himself uh, in a short period of time. He's only 20, still a long way to go. Uh, hopefully he's got a good head on his shoulders and he, he keeps focused. But um, for Christian Pulisic, this is an amazing move and an amazing opportunity. This, is good, this could really be a launching pad to the next level for, um, for an American youngster, which is, which is fantastic news. Yeah, and I think for, from NBC's standpoint, you already saw them lead the, uh, the pregame show with it yesterday. Uh, there is some skepticism that was expressed by, uh, by Martino and Musto. I mean, Martino saying he thinks he'll be a hit in the Premier League, but maybe it won't be a Chelsea. I think his concerns are similar to mine, that he'll fit with Sorry, I have no doubt about that. I just don't have any faith, given Chelsea's history. We know we, every time Chelsea appoints a new manager, we hear, okay, this is the one Roman has kind of calmed down. They're not going to cycle through uh, managers again. We've heard that now about Sarri because it's it's more, quote, the preferred playing style uh, or style of play that, that Abramovich wants to see. But we don't know what's going to happen long term with him. Musto was, uh, ha- had some other concerns. Musto raised the issue that I continuously raise, which is that he has actually lost his place at Dortmund. Let's not forget that. Dortmund right now is one of the top clubs in Europe uh, in terms of, not clubs, but, you know, top teams in terms of their performances uh, this season in the Bundesliga. Uh, but as they've been improving, uh, he's been playing less and less. So that's a concern. However, he's going to be in the Premier League, and NBC is going to be able to milk this. They needed an American to build around, uh, maybe to get, give themselves a boost. The, the year they got the Premier League rights is the year Clint Dempsey left the Premier League. And they've had scatterings of American field players, Jeff Cameron, 
obviously played a lot for Stoke, but defenders aren't uh, sexy. Matt Miaska got a uh, a couple matches uh, at Chelsea, started two matches uh, consecutively, uh, then fell out of sight. But again, he's a defender. Uh, you've had other uh, Premier uh, Americans uh, cycle in and cycle out. Right now, Timmy Ream is on a run of starting several matches in a row for Fulham. DeAndre Yedlin's a regular for Newcastle. Again, two defenders. Yep. So this is the first time they're going to have an American attacking player that they can build around and they can highlight uh, in their coverage. And I think that's going to make a big difference. Yeah, and NBC Sports is, is good at the hype machine. So, um, so they can definitely uh, take advantage of that by, uh, for sure. Now, Kartik, one more news item, and that is just in terms of this weekend. It's a big weekend for football uh, around the world and for viewers in the United States. It means the return of uh, uh, the, the, the seasons for Liga MX is coming back on Friday. Uh, Liga 1 is back. Uh, the uh, Primera Liga from Portugal is back, as well as La Liga. La Liga kicks off on Thursday with, with uh, Villarreal against uh, Real Madrid. And, of course, you get the FA Cup. So the FA Cup is uh, is back. This is the third round. Uh, begins on Friday with uh, Tranmere against uh, Spurs. Goes all the way through till Monday. Uh, in total, there's going to be 32 matches. All 32 matches will be shown live on ESPN+. And um, if you want a free trial, there's actually a link on the, uh, the worldsoccertalk.com uh, homepage for, for seven days. You get a free trial. But this, this, is, a bit, this is big news with uh, the leagues coming back, but also with the FA Cup. To give you an idea of how big this is, if you live in England or Wales or Scotland and you want to watch the FA Cup, out of the 32 games, only six of them, only six are televised. Uh, we get all 32 games live streaming on ESPN+. Plus. So it's a big deal. Uh, the challenge, I think, Kartik, for me at least, is going to be figuring out which matches to watch. Uh, of course, I'll watch my Swansea play, but outside of that... There's going to be like six or seven games on at, at, at uh, any, any given time and trying to figure out which of those is the one to watch. I'm, a, I'm anticipating a lot of flipping back and forth to figure out which one's the best one, as well as probably, probably following social media to see uh, which, ones are, which matches are taking off. But how are you going to do it, Kartik? Well, I, I had a little bit of experience with this this season with uh, MLS Live, which was on the same platform on ESPN+, Plus, where they, they give you a score right? Uh, and if you're on the ESPN app. So uh, I think a lot of times I'll be watching a match. I'll zoom out of that match for a minute, see what the scores are in other matches, or obviously Twitter is also a, a tool, and maybe flip around. But I my, my plan is to do, uh, as you said, probably watch four or five matches in, in a given time slot, particularly that 3 p.m. Uh, UK time, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time time slot. Yep, uh, yep, good tip there from uh, from you, Kartik. Uh, good, good stuff. All right, moving on to TV ratings uh, from this past week. This is uh, monopolized really by the Premier League. I mean, so much coverage of the Premier League, uh, but there was ga one game in Italy that, that did pop up on our radar, and that was Juventus against Sampdoria on ESPN two on Saturday. Uh, this was an early kickoff. I think it was a six thirty to eight thirty Eastern time kickoff. Uh, Seventy seven thousand viewers which is not bad for a game that early in the morning on an ESPN2. Um, so, so it's good to see that uh, Serie A there on the radar. The big one, Kartik, was uh, Liverpool against Arsenal. Uh, one, well, basically one million viewers for this one on NBC and Universo on Saturday in that 12.30 to 2.30 Eastern time slot. Temp time slot. Uh, NBC's Premier League uh, matches from Boxing Day delivered the, the most watched non-weekend Boxing Day uh, viewership since 2013. So in like what, uh, like five years, uh, they posted an, an average uh, audience of 385,000 viewers, which was up 6% from, from last year. Anything else, Kartik, that, that stood out for you worth mentioning? Yeah, that the uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer debut match got almost as many viewers on NBC as Liverpool Arsenal, which tells us two things. One, there was a lot of uh, curiosity about Solskjaer, but also two, Man United still, uh, Man United on their own can get the same number that Liverpool and Arsenal can combined at times. That's, that's pretty uh, uh, earth shattering because I don't think there were many Carter fans tuning in to watch that in the States. That's, uh, that's a pretty telling sign that if United got back to being the United under Fergie or under Busby, uh, the kind of numbers you might see in the U.S. relative to other sides. And that's the other thing, too, about Manchester United and, and NBC Sports is that NBC Sports uh, have, haven't had a year 
where Man United have won the Premier League. Um, right. So, so for perhaps for next season, if you have, you mean you got Chelsea with uh, Pulisic, you got Liverpool. I mean, maybe trying to win two titles in a row, perhaps. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but a rejuvenated Man United in contention, as well as, of course, all the other clubs. Um, that could be a big year for NBC Sports, uh, in theory. I'll have to wait and see. All right, moving on to listener mailbag. Uh, the first up is Daniel. He says, hi, guys. I know you usually take questions sometimes, but I listened to this week's podcast, and I was wondering, besides the Bundesliga and the Championship, what other leagues in general do you think are always exciting? I was so caught up in the Premier League and La Liga hype that I forgot what good soccer is sometimes. Uh, not saying these leagues are bad, but I love watching exciting matches where teams show on the field quality almost daily. Um, so that's, I, I actually goes on to say, thanks again for taking my question. I, I love the podcast. Also, my friend is a Leeds United supporter since she is from West Yorkshire and she always likes Liverpool. So do you think Leeds uh, has a great chance of getting up into the Premier League again, and if you do, is it okay to support two teams in the same league? So two questions there, Kartik. Uh, I'll, I'll take the second one, which is, um, is it okay to support two teams? I don't think it is, Kartik, especially when it's Leeds United and Liverpool. If Leeds get promote, gets promoted and she's also a Liverpool fan, that's a tough one. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of somebody. Although they have, they have the same big rival, though. That's yeah. That's right. That one's a little bit of a unique one. That's true. Both, yeah. Yeah. So they 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 both hate uh, Man United with a mad passion. So um, yeah, that, that's tricky. I mean, I, I guess in some ways there might be some American listeners that were Fulham fans and, and then became Everton fans, and even now support maybe they support Everton or maybe they support Fulham now. Um, but uh, but to me, it's a big no no to support two clubs. But uh, so how about you, Kartik? What do you think about uh, the first part of the question in terms of uh, what other leagues other than the Bundesliga and the Championship are recommended and also your take on uh, Leeds and, and Liverpool and, and Leeds' chances of going up? Serie A is pretty um, hit or miss. I mean, you still uh, got a very good chance if you watch Fiorentina or Napoli to see entertaining football. Napoli last season under Sarri was – the last few seasons under Sarri were the best – arguably the best team to watch in Europe. Uh, but if you watch a Juventus match, you're down, bound to see a 1-0 where uh, the other team is playing very tactically against Juventus. Uh, and same thing it seems to be happening now with, with Inter and AC Milan. So I would recommend watching Serie A. If it, and Roma, it's good to watch too. So if it's Roma, Napoli, Fiorentina, if it's a non uh, quote elite team if it's not one of those elite northern teams uh, Bundesliga obviously highly recommend you mentioned that championship highly recommend I think there's a lot of fun football from what I understand uh, I haven't watched as much of it as I'd like to but a lot of fun football now in Scotland this season uh, I've watched a few matches but, but just haven't watched it regularly enough but that's available uh, you have to buy the soccer pass or the league pass on Bleacher Report live but uh, that is available in in the U.S. Uh, in a more kind of accessible fashion albeit expensive one uh than it has been in the past yeah for me it would be uh liga mx uh not that every game is exciting but but uh oftentimes there's off off the pitch drama as far as uh, very passionate emotional coaches getting into it on the sidelines but um but the games themselves uh, oftentimes are, are entertaining high level of football um some sometimes great passion in the crowds too uh, and sometimes that that un unpredictability, which is always enjoyable, um, and and it's you know what the number one most accessible league in the United States in terms of being able to watch those games, that would be my tip on that one. So, Kartik, you think Leeds will go up at this point? Yeah, I think there's a very good chance. Uh, they every time they've had a wobble, and I said this the other night when I was on Talksport, every time they've had a wobble this season or have had injuries, they've come out of it. Now this Forest match, we didn't we neglected to mention earlier, it was. Uh, uh, Calvin Phillips got sent off, uh, and uh, they they might have gotten something. Likely would have gotten something if it hadn't been for that. So, uh, I think what you're what you're seeing is Bielsa's training methods, which are intense, paying off because they look a fitter side than the other sides around them in the league. So, I, I think they probably will go up. Yeah, me too. Me too. They, they look strong, and, and as far as depth, uh, a lot of players off the bench making a, a big impact uh, there. Um, one more thing, Kartik, and this was something that came up uh, last week's podcast, and I forgot who, who uh, posted the question, so I apologize. But um, one of the questions was about the Club World Cup, and I think we skipped over it. 
and I was thinking about that uh, this past week, is that, um, of course, the Club World Cup is uh, well and truly over. Uh, the question was about, um, you mean, why isn't it more popular? Why isn't, why isn't there any coverage about it? And, and the reality is it's a, it's a big difference because if you talk to a lot of Latin American soccer fans, you mean, whether they're fans, uh, you mean, whether from Colombia or Argentina or Brazil or other places, um, they seem to definitely put the, the kind of the FIFA Club World Cup on a diff- different pedestal than fans of European soccer. And for most fans of European soccer, that tournament, um, or even going back to its predecessor, has never really been that important, has never been that meaningful. Uh, but to fans of Latin American soccer, it always has been. And, and that's something from this, I mean, we didn't even talk about it. We haven't, been, we haven't said a word about the Club, Club World Cup. Um, with I mean, Real Madrid going, going all the way there too. But uh, that tournament, to me, actually had a potential of being something this, uh, what, a couple of weeks ago, when you had an opportunity for River Plate to play Real Madrid in the final, except that River Plate lost on penalty kicks in the semifinal. And then it was uh, Kashima Antlers against uh, Real Madrid and a very one-sided match with Real Madrid winning that one. But uh, a River Plate against uh, Real Madrid would have, been a, would have been something that would have been on people's radars a lot more and I think that's one of the challenges with the Club World Cup is that oftentimes there's, there's teams, whether from New Zealand or from, or from Japan or from, uh, you mean, kind of um, Elahi, I think it was, from uh, I think uh, the Middle East, uh, teams that, that don't have a, a presence worldwide, don't have much of a following, you mean, especially in the United States. And it's hard to take that tournament very seriously because, you mean, it's teams that we're not familiar with. I'm sure they play good football. Um, and at the same time, too, the the kickoff times are. You I mean usually it's early in the morning, um, and and this particular tournament, I think, it was on. I think it was on Fox Sports, uh, and and uh, Telemundo. And you I mean to me, I, I didn't watch a minute of of the tournament. Uh, how about you, Kartik? Yeah, I didn't watch a minute of it. I, I actually forgot about it, and was expecting a River Plate Real Madrid final, and got told the day later River Plate had lost lo- had lost on penalties to the team from the Middle East, and. I uh, thought, oh, well, okay, now there there goes that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I didn't pay attention. Yeah, yeah, same here. Anyway, good question, and apologies for uh, not mentioning that, so not answering that last week. Uh, next up is Greg, uh, You'll Never Walk Alone. He says, excellent pod as always. I encourage you to check out Off Script with Graham Lasso, which aired last Wednesday night on NBCSN. Honest and thoughtful conversation about his career, and some difficult times on and off the pitch it was very interesting and very much worth watching. I missed that one, Kartik. I know you watched it, and I, hopefully it's on the um, NBC Sports YouTube channel or if, uh, NBC Sports uh, Live or Extra or whatever it's called these days um, for, for a replay, but I'll have to check that one out. JP says, it's been said many times, but Fox's lack of promotion doesn't help unless it Unless you're already a soccer fan and follow when and what matches are on through various apps or websites like this, you would never know about them. As mentioned in the podcast, uh, the quick cut to other programming after a match concludes makes the production feel amateur, like watching a poker game on ESPN2 at 1 o'clock in the morning. At the very least, there should be a short 15-minute show uh, studio recap to bookend the pregame coverage, if any, and the actual match, uh, much like being sports does. And JP is referencing, I think, the Premier League. I, I'm sorry, the Bundesliga. And it was, um, I think it was that last week's game, the, the Dortmund um, uh, Mönchengladbach game. And just as soon as the game was over, they kind of cut away and then went straight on to some other show. On even, uh, oh, it was, it was the betting show with uh, Rachel Bonetta. But uh, some some good feedback there from JP. Jason says, uh, have you seen, this is more for you, Kartik, I think, have you seen any evidence that New York City FC's fan base has grown due to contributions of its connection to Manchester City? I, for one, am a Manchester City fan, but my favorite MLS team is Orlando. So for me personally, the connection is irrelevant. Yeah, I think uh, all I've seen is that Man City fans who had no interest in MLS, or existing Manchester City fans that had no interest in MLS, um, now have passing interest in MLS because they keep an eye on New York City FC, but they don't, they're not passionate fans. They don't watch the matches very closely. They just keep track of what they're doing in the table. Uh, and, and maybe a, a few players here and there. One of them, by the way, Jack Harrison is uh, 
uh, turned into quite a good player for Leeds United. Uh, he's now on loan at Leeds United. But uh, yeah, I don't think that there's much of a connection, and, and it hasn't. If that was the goal of, of putting a team in MLS, it hasn't been successful uh, for City Football Group. I don't know what their goals actually were, uh, but if that was specifically the goal to drive more interest to Manchester City, have this kind of correlation where fans of one club supported the other, it hasn't happened in, in the kind of uh, manner that maybe they had hoped. Next up is Nico. Nico says, like some of your listeners, I'm a college student here in the U.S. I would like to express my dislike for the current trend of capitalism in the beautiful game. Seasons before, many of my friends would be able to watch uh, whichever Premier League game or Champions League game they wanted. And it brought us closer together because we would be able to switch back and forth to get to see all of our favorite teams. There is a common area at my university where a crowd of 35 students used to come together together, together from different backgrounds and sit there and watch Champions League games on FS1 or Premier League games on NBC, which, which was provided by our, t- our TV package. I am disgusted with how Turner has pigeonholed the supporters of clubs to watching one game of their choice and for- forcing others to pay for the extra service Uh, despite already having a TV package. I do understand the model and what they are trying to do, but as college students, we cannot afford NBC Sports Gold, Fox Soccer Match Pass, BR Live, and ESPN+. It baffles me that we wonder why some viewership is down when we simply can't view these games anymore. I am an Arsenal fan, so I have been lucky enough to see many of their games this season, but this game will not grow in this country if someone can't stumble across maybe a Dortmund game in the Champions League and see the fans and the yellow wall and the passion of the game. You fall in love with that, and I would rather uh, watch every Arsenal match in Spanish on Univision than suffer through Tottenham versus Inter or Bayern versus IEK Athens just because uh, the only option is TNT. I love the podcast, and Happy New Year. Yeah, and Kartik, I think that goes back to what we were saying in the first segment, which is that um, a lot of these networks or seeing the potential of soccer and seeing that there's a a hardcore fan base that are willing to pay whatever it costs to actually subscribe to watching these channels. Uh, Short term, that helps in terms of generating revenue for these companies. Long term, it hurts the the, the growth of the game in the United States. Um, At the same time, though, Kartik, it's... um, I don't blame the, the networks. I mean, the networks, are, in terms of the rights fees for a lot of these um, leagues, like, for example, the Premier League for the six-year deal was approximately a billion dollars. And NBC Sports has to figure out, okay, how do we monetize this? We can, all right, yes, we have advertising on the television, but are there other, other ways that we can uh, charge our subscribers or customers to figure out a way to be able to, to break even or, or to make a slight profit? Um, that's part of the issue. It's not just NBC Sports or Fox Sports or TNT. Um, the rights fees have gone up so much where I mean, they're trying to figure out how to make money. And they, they're, in, they're in a business to make money. So what's your take on this, Kartik? Any, any, anything different there? No, I, I tend to agree with him. I think another problem is Bleacher Report Live is clunky compared to ESPN+. Plus. We keep going back to this about not only is ESPN Plus's price point right, but the, the technology is good and you can you can kind of channel surf within if you want to call it that with it that's an old term but within the app once you're on a match and bleach your report live if you kill that if you kill that match try and log into another one there's all the always these like login issues and uh then not knowing the scores of other matches they don't they, they don't seem to be seamlessly integrated the way they are with espn plus so that's another problem even if you pay for that uh and you just want to kind of uh, experience multiple matches at one time, it's very difficult to do mm-hmm. the way they've set up that uh, that streaming product. And everything else uh, he's saying, I agree with as well. So, uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's it's problematic. And I think ultimately, I, I, the TNT coverage has gotten better. Uh, the actual on-air, uh, on television coverage has gotten better these last few match days. I'd like to see them do something about that streaming product. Maybe it's tough in the middle of a season to do it but mm-hmm. next season they have this the rights for two more years uh make this a little more robust and, and dynamic uh believe to report live for those of us who do subscribe to it and pay for it yeah the challenge with that though can't because when i interviewed the uh, bleach report ceo which is going back in the podcast uh, probably about two or three months ago um i asked that about uh, the actual br live was that a homegrown in-house built uh, streaming service and he said no it's it's a product called iStream planet and they've taken that and then kind of, um, kind of cosmetically changed it a little bit to make to make it work for Bleacher Report Live. 
uh, because they had such a, a short turnaround time in terms of when they uh, knew that they'd, they'd get the rights. They had no streaming product, and they had to figure out, okay, do we build it or do we go out and, and, and buy it? And, and they bought it. Uh, they basically bought you know, you mean, you, a white label or whatever it is uh, to use it. Uh, t to be fair, I, th I think in some way, I mean, to me personally, um, most of the streaming platforms are clunky. So, for example, um, ESPN Plus to me is clunky. I, I have logout and login issues with that. Uh, BR Live is, is, is clunky too, definitely, without a doubt, in terms of being able to navigate through it seamlessly and going from match to match and not having to go through like three or four clicks just to, to, to find what you know is there. Um, Fubo can be clunky too. I mean, a lot of it depends on what interface you're using. So if you're using... Uh, the website, the website's going to be completely different than the app. The app might be more seamless and more uh, intuitive. Um, the only one I've seen so far that's been completely seamless and completely uh, really easy to use and really intuitive has been DAZN. But DAZN right now I think has the J-League and I think one other uh, Asian League, I think maybe the K-League, and that's it. So... Um, as we've talked about, actually, and let's mention this, Kartik. As we've talked about in the past before, I think a, a couple of podcasts, uh, we've mentioned that uh, the Bundesliga is probably a good destination for DAZN and, and for, for DAZN to acquire it um, once those rights become available. Um, and actually, I think it was Sports Business Daily last week in the predictions for 2019 said that uh, they expect uh, the Bundesliga to go to DAZN. Uh, now, whether that's inside knowledge or whether that is listening to us or if it's just a educated guess I'm, I'm not sure but they're predicting that so d so for I mean whether it's BR Live or Fubo or ESPN Plus to me it's like you guys need to look at the zone and see how they're doing things because that that is going to be the uh, the difference maker at, at least right now in the industry Next up is Mark Lemke Mark says I just listened to your podcast I really enjoyed enjoyed it uh do you think that Bundesliga stays on Fox? If not, where can the Bundesliga land in the States? I know they take the American market very seriously. And and just to follow up on that, Mark, as far as kind of the zone, I think that's definitely probably the most likely destination for it, uh, given two reasons. One is that the zone is desperate for soccer content. Uh, they know they have a good platform. They know they, they have good boxing and uh, probably MMA and other things like that. They know that they need that soccer audience. Uh, and for people like you and I and the listeners, uh, if they can add the Bundesliga to it, uh, that's something that probably a lot of us would actually check out to zone and, and see, I mean, that 30 day trial. Is it worth it to get to get uh, to watch the Bundesliga on there? Vice versa. It really hasn't worked out for the Bundesliga, Bundesliga on Fox. I think there's, there was a lot of hope that uh, Fox would be a great partner. It hasn't worked out, out that way. From what I understand, the Bundesliga is not happy with the relationship with Fox and um, it's very likely that, uh, that the Bundesliga will probably look elsewhere or look for a partner that's, that's kind of a better integrated uh, with them to, to basically build the growth of, of the Bundesliga in the United States. Edwin, last but not least, says, uh, Good podcast, guys. Bundesliga isn't a viable TV product in the U.S., so it's no wonder why Fox probably won't renew. He says, Abysmal ratings. Uh, the very biggest games can't get past uh, sixty to 85,000 on FS1 and 300,000 on Big Fox. I think Fox may keep TV talent, uh, keep them around for Major League Soccer. And he says, last but not least, uh, Fox made out like bandits in the corrupt FIFA World Cup no bid, getting three World Cups and the very lucrative 2026 US World Cup. I'd actually disagree on that last part. I think Fox made out bandits for uh, the 2026 World Cup, but for 2018, uh, not having the US qualify, and then you got the 2022 World Cup, which is going to be a winter World Cup. So they'll be uh, over the course of, um, you mean, kind of the, uh, I think, November, December. Um, and still a question mark whether the U.S. will actually qualify for that tournament, too. Um, it could be that they have two duds. You mean, the 2018 World Cup, they lost money on, uh, had to make several uh, layoffs. The 2022 World Cup is likely to be similar to that, probably worse than that. Um, so unless the U.S. qualifies, and that might give it a little bit of a bump. Uh, in 2026, that's the big one, but um, that's a lot of money to spend for one World Cup. Kartik, any, any takes, any uh, last thoughts on uh, some of these list of mailbag uh, 
feedback or, or input. Okay. All right. So you can always reach us through email if you have any questions, uh, feedback, or uh, want to give us some advice, etc., um, or give us any takes or any hot takes. You can reach us through email, and the email address is web at worldsoccertalk.com, as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk, and on Twitter at worldsoccertalk. Plus, of course, you can always reach, reach us through the comments section on worldsoccertalk.com. So thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audio Boom, and worldsoccertalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review on iTunes. We would greatly appreciate it. And Kartik, over to you. Enjoy your football. <laughs>